Hi everybody, this is Patrick Rocks, and this is my presentation on the Gordon Music Learning Theory. So in this presentation, we're going to cover the big ideas of this Gordon Learning Theory, including audiation, how music learning is sequenced um, and related to the sequence of learning language. Um, we're going to talk about musical aptitude and uh, implications for music teachers. Uh, we'll kind of sum up all of the ideas and some key takeaways, and then I'll share some um, learning activities where we can apply some of these theories. All right, so, so to start, um, one of the big ideas of the Gordon music learning theory is this idea of audiation. This is actually a term that Gordon himself created, and essentially it's thinking in music. The idea of ideate um, is to have a thought, um, and then audiation, audio, has to do with um, sound. Um, and so the idea of thinking in music or using the brain um, in the process of um, music making, um, sometimes it's considered to be this idea of just inner hearing or hearing sounds in your head um, or being able to sing a song kind of in your head, not using your ears or your voice or an instrument. Um, but um, audiation really requires this idea of contextualization and comprehension. For example, if you were um, asked by someone who spoke a different language to repeat a word, maybe after a couple of repetitions, you would be able to pronounce that word correctly, um, but it doesn't necessarily know that you know what it means. It doesn't mean that you know what that word means, and it also doesn't mean that you know how to use that word in a sentence or to communicate. So just hearing sounds within your head without context or without being able to comprehend them um, is not useful. And so the idea of audiation is taking our context of music learning up to that point to make some sort of sense out of sounds that we can um, hear within our own brain. Um, in his own research, um, Gordon identified that that children learn this musical context um, very young in their lives, basically from between the age uh, that they're born to the age of five. Um, and that in that time, that is the most um, beneficial uh, period of a child's life to develop a musical competency, to develop musical syntax. And that essentially means identify um, tonalities, um, cadences, um, rhythmic patterns that are common in cultural music that, uh, that an individual is a part of, um, scales. Um, these are not taught in any explicit way, more um, through um, just listening to the, the, the sounds around them. Um, the, uh, another really interesting important point about audiation is that um, in, a, in a lot of ways, it's about um, the brain being able to predict um, musical outcomes based on the context that someone has. For example, if I played a, a B flat major scale, we can hear, hopefully, with the context that we've developed, that leading tone is going to the octave B flat. Um, in our head, we, we can predict that that's where that's going to go. Um, and before we move on, this, this idea of audiation, um, this is another phrase that was used by Gordon, audiation is to music as thought is to language. So another way for us to kind of think about it. And that's a good sequence um, to uh, segue to this next idea, which is sequential learning. Um, Gordon suggests that humans learn language and music through parallel processes. Um, he uses this idea of vocabularies that for a person to be proficient in language, they need to have uh, five vocabularies. They need to have a listening, speaking, thinking, reading, and writing vocabulary. And this ordering is important because this is how the human bot, the human brain um, developmentally learns how to use a language. They first listen to the language being spoken to them as a child. They're not being expected to repeat it. They're just taking in context for what the language sounds like, um, the sounds that they that they will be using um, in, in language. Then they try to practice it. They try speaking it. Um, eventually, once you can speak and you can get sentences together, you can start internalizing that 
um, thinking into thought. Um, and then once they go to school, they start reading and they start to write. And that's kind of the, the five steps to being proficient in, in language. Parallel um, to how we learn language, very similarly, we learn music the same way. We, interp we internalize sounds as infants by listening to our parents. We listen to music that is played at the house or at other, um, maybe at church or um, other, at, um, uh, other activities where you're, you're just taking in the sounds around you. Then um, you try to start mimicking that. Maybe you try to sing, you try to hum along. Um, as, as an infant, you maybe can do some chanting. Maybe your body, it starts to move in dance-like uh, movements. Um, if you can do those things, then we get to this level of audiation where you can start thinking musically. Um, and this leads to the ability for young children to actually be able to improvise if they have their listening and singing and chanting um, skills kind of learn the audiation is kind of the natural progression. Reading and writing become uh, a much more high level um, goal in terms of music. Um, that's that's more um, kind of down the, down the road, but um, it is important to note that these top three Gordon suggests are kind of learned passively by a student just kind of accepting ideas um, as they come to them, accepting the, the musical content that's around them. And then the bottom two are more formally taught within a school context. Um, finally, the idea of aptitude comes into play. Um, sometimes there's this belief that either you have musical talent or you don't. Um, but Gordon suggests that because everyone learns language and music the same way, every student has the ability to be successful and to achieve success in music. If a student is struggling to comprehend music, musical ideas or perform musical um, excerpts or um, just just be musical, it's very likely that there's a deficit um, in their ability to listen or their ability to sing or, or repeat. Um, and, and so that's important for us to note as as teachers. Um, Gordon used this term musically impoverished that students come to us um, in when they're five years old, maybe in, in the kindergarten age, maybe not having the, the musical background that is um, appropriate. And so we as teachers need to be co conscious of that. So um, the key takeaways, one is that music learning is a complex and sequential process that begins before students even come into the building. It starts at their birth through their, adult, their, their, um, their, their childhood stage, um, and they come to us with this context already in place. Um, students who may struggle to perform or read music likely are insufficient in their musical context and syntax. As teachers, we should continue to, developing, uh, to develop students' listening, speaking, and audiating skills, um, along with teaching them how to read and how to perform. And finally, that we have to have this idea, we have to believe that every student has the potential to be um, to achieve musically and um, that we can go back to the root of um, where students develop these skills, listening, repeating, speaking, singing, dancing, moving to music. All right, so um, the next couple slides are just going to be um, some ideas that um, I wanted to share about how we can apply these um, theories to our class. So these are the three activities, fill in the blank, um, clapping game, and error detection. So with fill in the blanks, it's very simple. We take a simple melody. And what I do is I ask students to listen. And while I'm playing, I'll just kind of start taking notes away um, and ask them to hear those in their head. So maybe we'll take the last phrase of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And maybe I'll ask them to sing what they think the last note is, just to see if they are in the same tonality, if their, their inner ear has perceived the tonal center. Um, another thing you can do with this same activity is you can make it more predictable. Rather than take out random notes and have their ear kind of respond um, kind of on cue, you can um, play um, or sing a, a first phrase and have them sing 
or play the consequent phrase. Um, probably singing is going to be more appropriate because it takes some of the technique out of it. Um, but if you said, all right, I'm going to perform the first part of this song and I'm going to ask you to perform the part that follows. Don't have to get super technical with like consequent antecedent, all that stuff, but really just get the students responding musically. So I could say, respond when I stop playing. And hopefully they sang. And if they didn't, that's okay. Then you can go back a step and have them do some more audiation um, before they sing. And it's just kind of, a, it's that sequence. Um, if they are able to do something, try the next thing more complicated. Um, all right, so another uh, activity that I like to do that, in, it, that um, tests students and, and improves their audiation skills is this clapping game. So I'll use a metronome um, and I'll say, clap when you get to the ninth beat. Ready, go, one. Okay, so hopefully they've counted in their head, they're thinking about what beat they're on, they're maybe tapping their foot, they're moving, and then when they get to the ninth beat, they clap. I like to use the clap because um, it shows me what they're thinking in their head. Um, it also is a really cool way to build trust where everybody, if they all get it together, it's this really cool moment where they all clap together, it builds that camaraderie. If they can do it with one beat, add two, so say clap on beat three and beat nine. You can try it faster. You can try to get up to five or you know six numbers and put them on the board. And they, it, sometimes it can become a fun um, game um, with a little bit of a competitive edge. Another thing you can do, if you start to introduce some um, literacy to audiation, is you can take um, either a repertoire you're working on or a, a rhythm exercise and identify kind of a point of arrival for the student. So in this example um, here, I would say, all right, guys, we're going to start at, at measure one, and I want you to think the sounds in your head. Um, and when you get to measure six, beat three, I want you to clap when you get there. And so we'll start a metronome and I'll say, you know, clap when you get to measure six, beat three. This shows me, um, are they just reading the quarter notes? Are they perceiving the rest? Are they thinking at the same tempo that they're hearing the metronome? Um, this is another uh, great way to kind of introduce some literacy and tracking music and keeping um, in time while building some of their audiation skills. And just want to shout out, this is um, this exercise is from the Darcy Vaught Williams Teaching Rhythm and Logically um, sequence. It's a great rhythm exercise um, pedagogy, essentially. So um, just wanted to name that here. And then our last one um, that I like to use is called error detection, um, where I intentionally make rhythmic pitch or tone errors in a musical excerpt. Sometimes it's an, uh, an excerpt that we've been working on, a line from a method book um, or something that they know really well. And sometimes it's something we're about to sight read. Um, in either case, I'll ask the kids to watch their music while I play. And in their head, I want them to kind of start developing this oral image of what they're seeing and applying it to what they should be hearing. Mostly they're really good at identifying um, rhythm errors. Uh, tone errors are also pretty easy for them to, to catch. The pitch is the hardest one, um, but I like to tell them I'm going to make three mistakes as I play um, through this exercise. Um, and when I'm done, I'm going to ask you to tell me where those mistakes were. This is a great exercise for them to be able to navigate a score and say, well, I heard you make a mistake in measure four on beat two. And then I'll say, okay, what was that mistake? Well, you played your half note for one beat as opposed to two. That's kind of the idea. So we can just try that really quickly. I'll play the first four measures um, and I'll make two mistakes. See if you can identify those. Here we go. So again, I'll pose that to this to the class. Where did I make a mistake? And really what this is just checking and, and building the skill of is what you're hearing in your head, what you're seeing on the page matching up with what your ear is hearing. It's a great um, activity to kind of build that skill. Hope that helps. Hope you learned a little bit and thanks for watching.